Two decades ago, only about one in four Adivasis in Tamil Nadu's Gudalur town were literate, and the rate among Adivasi women was even lower. While the government provided specialized public schools for Adivasis, student enrollment was very low, and the conditions were far from adequate. Quote, non-Adivasi teachers and staff showed little empathy or concern for the Adivasi children. End quote. These are the words of the three guests that joined me for today's episode. This grim picture that I just shared has transformed significantly in much deeper ways than the brushstroke statistics I've just shared. We learn about the story behind this transformation. Welcome to Research Radio. I'm your host Abhishek, and I'm joined with a scholar and two educationists today. Aman Madan studied anthropology and currently teaches at Azim Premji University in Bengaluru. Dr. Madan works on promoting dialogue and justice through education. Rama Shastri has been a passionate teacher who has taught marginalized children for four decades. B. Ramdas has also been in the education space for four decades, and along with Rama, is a trustee of the Vishwa Bharati Vidyodaya Trust in Gudalur, the Nilgiris. Before we speak to them, a little more context. Rama and Ramdas, along with their colleagues, have worked to actualize the transformative potential of education for Adivasi students in the town of Gudalur, located in the Nilgiris. The town is home to five Adivasi communities: the Panyas, the Beta Kurumbas, the Melu Kurumbas, the Katu Nayakas, and the Irulas. They constitute about 10% of the population of Gudalur. We learn more about their educational journey based on an article published in EPW that I've linked in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining us on the show, Aman, Rama, and Ramdas. Yes, yes. we are thank also excited. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you for inviting us. So, could we start by understanding the historical context of the communities that you work with, and perhaps uh, describe what Gudalur is like? So, in mid eighties, uh, when Accord. Uh, the organization first started to work in this vicinity more than half the population were in bondage that's ramdas and the others were living on the uh, edge of of the mudumalai tiger reserve or inside the tiger reserve or in the middle of estates but unconnected with the large estate so you have the birlas you have hindustan lever all of them are owning thousands of acres of land over here so in the middle of these you have small pockets of these tribals living and completely unconnected with the life on the estate so actually uh, for all practical purposes most of the, the tribals here were hunter gatherers up until two generations back when the forest acts came into being they suddenly found that they could neither enter the forest nor did they have any place to go outside the forest because the the rest of it has been occupied by the large estates by migrants from uh, kerala and migrants from sri lanka so all these people had occupied all the land over there leaving them practically no space to go and it is in this context that the land rights movement begins so they had become encroachers in their own lands you know so the question of getting back some land from the forest department from the estates from land owners and in some places when the, even at the, at the time of the british some of these tribals had been given you know half an acre one acre of land their titles but they didn't know what it meant so they had given these papers to the land owners to for safe keeping so all that land had been taken away from them so the land rights movement was started essentially to redeem all this land it was started by colleagues of mine stan tekikara and mari along with a, a tribal group and they went from village to village and slowly mobilized the community to come together to get back land so the question was very simple just get back the land and cultivate it now we have managed to get back as much as around 1500 acres of land in bits and pieces so much so you know every family has anything from quarter of an acre to 2 acres at the most so across the whole uh, gudalur and uh, block we have bits and pieces of land all over but people have learned to cultivate and so we moved from hunter gatherers to cultivators in this short period of time so this is the background in which the whole movement takes place i so, also want to add that there are some 300 odd 320 odd villages situated in a 50 km radius they're not very close by so they're all dispersed if you look at a map they're all along the edge of the forest and quite far apart that's rama access to these villages is not easy very few are along motorable roads so any child for instance for example coming to school will have to walk anywhere from 2 to 5 km to a motorable road and then take a transport to school 
So the, the Adivasi Munitra Sangam itself was started uh, to every village, he started a small Sangha and these Sanghas then sort of uh, federated into the Adivasi Munitra Sangam around uh, 1990. So around five years after the work started, did all these things come together. So in 1988 on December 5th was a major um, yeah, sort of a demonstration, demonstration in Gudalur town. You know. I mean, it was shocking for the local community as well as the authorities because they never realized that there were so many pe- tribals in, in the whole uh, block. But it was even more shocking for the tribals themselves because they didn't realize that there were so many of them together. Because that day 10,000 people came together. So it was a huge uh, show of strength. And it made a big difference to their morale, and and that is how the, the the organization actually came together. Right, I think that that helps to understand the context. So your work talks about the need for political education that includes information about systems of domination and is different from apolitical approaches that's taken by large NGOs and the government. Could you tell me more about how you define political here? and your use of uh, the Brazilian educator Paulo Fierre's work? See, uh, this rests upon the idea that social life actually is made out of many different interests, many different points of view, many different social locations. That's Aman. And there may take place a tug of war, a political struggle, you know, often between them. Not all the time, but often. You know. Now, in the work of many NGOs and in the activities of the government often, uh, there is an attempt to gloss over this, not always, but often. So, now, such a presentation of what is actually a conflicted situation as being a non-conflicted, consensual situation, this can be unfair. And especially this can be unfair for the weak you know, because they begin to believe that the, the point of view of the powerful is correct and that is the point of view they should also take. Now, that may not always be correct. I, uh, often it's the situation where the point of view of the powerful is part of an oppression of the weak. So by accepting that point of view, they are actually reproducing that oppression. Now, now so this kind of way of thinking about power you know, and of uh, different standpoints, different social locations, their possible conflicts. Now, that is what informs this way of thinking about politics and the political. Now, um, this way of thinking will say that different cultures um, uh, or even social relationships, social structures, they may be involved in acts of domination you know, and also in acts of struggles against domination. Now, uh, this does not mean that there can be no agreement. Often and very often we find uh, we can agree on fair grounds on things, but that means identifying also situations where an understanding of what is fair may be distorted by ideologies, may be distorted by social interests, social locations. You know. Now, to be able to see that, it means, first of all, we need to step away from the dominant cultures and dominant ideologies, which shape our, our understanding of things. Now, uh, Paulo Freire's work is a very important milestone towards this in the field of education. How do you move away from, how do you begin to move away from uh, cultures, ways of looking at schooling, ways of looking at education, which are basically the ways which are convenient to the most powerful social classes, to the most powerful genders, to the most powerful communities. And we find that education is very strongly influenced by their point of views. And that is circulated as what is a good education for everybody, which it may not be. Sometimes it may be, often it is not. So Paulo Freire, among others, he says that one of the first conditions of an education that will empower the weak is help them to understand this conflicted nature of school education and of knowledge and of culture. So this this sense of, of politics, being able to see school education, the world around us, uh, our existence as, as a point where there are many struggles taking place and becoming aware of how what we are told may actually be convenient to somebody and may not be immediately useful or, or important for me. You know, this awareness, you know, this is crucial to Freire's work and he uses the term conscientization. You know, conscientization is uh, one of the central ideas of what later comes to be called, what he also calls, later comes to be called a critical pedagogy approach in education, which is that be aware of the relations of power and domination, how t- uh, which are operating on you and schooling, which helps you to become aware of that. You know? This is the sense of, of power and politics, which, uh, I mean, which we are talking with and which I think the school is also expressing. Mm-hmm. That's quite interesting. And uh, could you share some examples of how this is practiced in a classroom setting? 
so when we start uh, social studies classes in class 3 only children are uh, not taught with you know like the third standard book talks of india and states of india and the capitals of the states and all that we start with gudalur where are the villages where are, where is your village situated and we try to map the places where the children come on the floor where they come from and how far they are from each other and understand distances we start with that with gudalur and then we talk about the kind of things that their environment has this is in terms of geography and in terms of history their uh, about the different uh, communities that live the tribal communities that live in gudalur and look at each other and see what tribes they come from what communities they are from and uh, what what has been the history of their community the tribal community like we get some village elder to come and talk about how the movement which ramdas talked about earlier uh, where all the tribal groups got together and uh, in a show of identification and trying to show of strength and that there are so many of us and the word adivasi and how they live and we have a small uh, center where we have kept some of the things they used to use in the past and some of them they still use now as a kind of uh, a kind of museum and the teacher will take them around these are third standard children so teacher goes with them and then they see and the child says oh i have like this this kind of a thing in my house oh my mother uses this for fishing or oh, my father uses this for something else and then they talk about these things and what they are called in their own languages and uh, what what the use is and the, you know so these things then they write about they write the same thing this is their history lesson and geography lesson it's not taken from any textbook so they start like this before going into by the time they finish the third standard then they go into tamil nadu and the rest of the communities around here another important thing we have done is also try to give importance to their language they different their each one i mean this is by the central institute of indian languages in mysore they they say that these are not dialects these are independent languages we cannot say for sure whether they have been the origin of the other languages dominant languages that are here malayalam tamil and all that they were probably earlier speakers of the language so and uh, they they have certain parameters by which they they apply to define what is a language and what is a dialect so they say these by the grammar and vocabulary and things like that so they have said and they have told us i mean we began to distinguish this only after they enlightened us about this kind of a difference because we were saying these are dialects because they don't have a script they said no this is a language so these are five different languages that are here in gudalur and uh, the children who come to our school are from four different communities language speaking communities so i mean we have to help them understand that there is uh, they have that the richness of their language is as important as the tamil they learn in school or which they hear around in their villages so they have to be able to see the value of their own and when they come first they only know their language they probably can understand some instructions in tamil but as far as uh, speaking tamil is not very easy for them so they we help them they we are our teachers who are from the community also speak to them in their own languages make them comfortable and make them feel that okay they are not in some alien place where some language is uh, and they can't understand or they don't know what to do we've built a lot on the language i mean we've tried to get the same central institute of indian languages in mysore sent uh, some 20 years back uh, some uh, they sent them uh, linguists who have worked on these languages and they brought out a script in each of these languages and um, we have used it's a modified tamil script and we have tried to bring about uh, these into make them into some written form but we have not been able to get experts to be able to develop it further so that it's accessible to children and they can learn from it i mean learn to read and write their own script but that that stage we have not been able to get to still uh, but uh, we have the script and we have the vocabulary written in that script but they're all not in usable form for the children like not as a textual matter we have in one language as a pre primary text for maybe 4 year olds who could use that but only in one language and because in our school we have four language speakers coming to our school we are not able to use that one book which we brought out in the paniya language they are the larger number but in other forms like in their other cultural forms like songs and dances and stories we use all that i mean um, the stories we use as lessons in tamil as well as in english essentially a language text has a story and then you draw out the vocabulary and the grammar and all the other exercises related uh, to that story instead of taking any story we take the story of their communities their traditional stories and we write, uh, use that to, for reading and writing we brought out one and we use that as a text form for tamil and english so the teacher prepares language materials from those stories 
and I was interested in the uh, broader tension between Adivasi's languages and the region's dominant language, Tamil. Given that the bureaucracy and commerce relies on the dominant language, how is this tension negotiated in, in AMS's educational efforts? The community cannot uh, operate or survive without uh, a good grasp of the dominant language. So there is no getting away from that. That uh, in Tamil Nadu in particular, that they are very particular about the, the language is, is another matter. It's a pity though because, uh, you know, the DMK, uh, the, the, the present uh, Dravida parties came to power on the whole plank of language in the 60s, you know, as against Hindi, it was uh, promoting Tamil. Yeah, unfortunately, once they came to power, they started to look down on any other language. So, so they started to change. For instance, place Uti has, you know, it was a, traditionally, it is a Toda name. It was called Uttakal Mand. The Mands are their uh, tri tribal villages and they've changed it to Uttaka Mandalam. So it has become a, a Tamil word for it. So things like that. And uh, also these uh, tribal schools also, you know, the headmasters and in these tribal schools also came from that background of Tamil background and the need to be able to promote Tamil. It was, a, it was a, an ideological position that they took. Uh, unfortunately, at the cost of these um, smaller uh, or languages like tribals all over Tamil Nadu. In our area, for instance, the headmasters would change the names of children from uh, their original names to Tamil names. So many of them today have two names. One is the name that they call themselves and one is the name given by the headmaster, which is a Tamil Hindu kind of a name. Uh, nevertheless, uh, one of the things that we have encouraged even before the, the AMS was formed as an organization was cultural revival. So under the, under the um, sort of an umbrella of Adivasi, we were able to bring um, all the five tribes together. So even before the organization was formed, the um, AMS, uh, the, the five tribes would come together in March uh, to have a cultural festival. In this cultural festival, they would sing and dance and have their traditional games and things like that, a whole day and night. So it was the first time that, you know, they, they're not dancing for somebody else or doing something for someone else, but for themselves. And with that, the the revival of sing, of their own uh, uh, rituals, their language, their, everything started to slowly. Become. Today we don't have that uh, thing, the cultural thing anymore, because it is not it's not necessary anymore. Because everywhere in all the villages, you have singing and dancing and their festivals and their, and the other thing is also that the uh, they, no 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 none of these people, young people even today are um, ashamed of speaking their language even in public. You will even find a lot of non-tribal speaking tribal languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to learn about uh, how the AMS has worked with or against the state and perhaps how this has shifted over time. See, to begin with, as you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the state was opposed to us. You see, the, uh, the forest department, revenue department, the police, you know, they're all together with the la local landlords and uh, arresting people, Every time we try to get back land or, you know, women are raped and so on and so on. We try to release people from bondage. So all, this whole thing has been going on over a period of time. But the um, whole thing has changed uh, over a period of time because a very important aspect of the AMS has been fairness. Let's say a tribal uh, person um, stole something from, from one of the estates or so, uh, took pepper or coffee or something. While we would provide the person with uh, legal assistance, a lawyer or whatever it is, we, the, as an organization, we never supported the person. You see, a wrong was a wrong, you know. So this idea that, you know, that we are very clear that uh, we would take up only issues that pertain to the whole community and what is just and right is a message that has gone across to the revenue department, to the police department, forest department, all of them over a period of time. You know, we wouldn't just take up uh, like any trade union, take up any kind of issues at any time just to keep things going. I think that this is, um, you know, for instance, there was a, there's a particular estate uh, here which has been completely opposed to uh, the Adivasi community, which lives right in the middle of the estate. And these people have been struggling to get a road access to the, to their. Uh, now, at one point, what happened is that uh, a local political party along with some other smaller uh, landlords in that vicinity and uh, a few of the tribals made it into a big issue of the political party against the estate. 
and finally what happened was that uh, there was a, some uh, violence and things took place so when the um, when the whole thing came to the uh, to the collector's office and matter was then the, both the estate and the police their whole argument was you see the ams was not involved the ams has not asked for this and the ams is not supporting this the ams is not supporting this so which means that this is an unjust claim <laughs> so for you know suddenly <laughs> uh, the ams became the arbiter of the whole matter you know so what is the role of the ams here was very clear that we would never take up so much so today the the police will not file or the forest department will not file a case against any tribal without checking with the ams first if the ams uh, um, local office says yes you go ahead and do it because this fellow should not have done this then they would file a case so the whole power balance now is uh, change uh, uh, and today the even to issue community yeah, certificates so, uh, if the um, the uh, uh, local um, district office wants to issue community certificates to the nadivasi the person has to come to the ams office and the uh, the ams president will give a letter without that letter the the district um, the district collector will not issue a community certificate he has to vouch that this person is an adivasi so this is the state to which we have now arrived so the no decision about adivasis is taken without consultation with the ams today if a particular piece of land uh, you know very often uh, the communist parties would also try to barge in there or, or one of the local parties would barge in to see whether they can always claim much more than what we are claiming but as far as the ams is concerned if a person wanted only this much of land then nothing more would be claimed i think uh, for the ams people also the uh, average adivasi he also realizes the fact that he has to live uh, his life with these people in the long run so at that point he is dependent on them for work he is dependent on them for his uh, livelihood so he has to be able to also live along with them so it's not a question of continuing to be in a state of conflict all the time so the idea that you can also resolve certain issues and be fair was also something that uh, no, i think some of this fairness also comes from them i mean from a kind of perspective they have i mean we see that even in games in the block here there are competitive games going on between different clubs and youth groups and things like that and uh, there was one kabaddi match a year ago where uh, the uh, youth group from another place all tribal uh, youth who took part in that uh, as one team they came second in the match but they they were given the prize for fairness i mean that is the best fair play game they were they won that that cup that was not a uh, a thing that was part of the competition but fact that the judge reported that they played a very fair game in all the groups that they competed against in all the matches they played the sense of fair play was very very strongly noticeable so i'm saying in, it's it's something that is there which is very strong in them i don't know whether we have it's not a thing of us inculcating anything in them also where the uh, they went to chennai to play yeah. the girls went to chennai <laughs> to play a football match and and they beat another team and when those girls started crying all these girls also started to cry over there you know because they went and hugged them and, you know felt so bad that the they said you can take our cup yeah, we'll give it to you cup. don't cry you know <laughs> they also cried with them there's no sense of competition in this yeah the idea is to commune these are things that i think we have learned to inculcate this whole ethos of the adivasi culture right right and how is conflict resolution dealt with uh, in a classroom environment you know children complain about other children like anywhere else like they are beating or they are fighting or something and uh, it's not resolved in the way that we have seen in uh, other practices like calling those children to the principal's room or talking to them it's all, it's the way in which the teachers deal with these situations that uh, builds a connection with the teacher and the student uh, the teachers all the teachers and the students together the the whole all the children bring up the issue in front of everyone else and the teachers also respond the children respond there is a nice uh, way of resolving that issue without having to get into very vehement and uh, you know uh, way of uh, shouting and scolding at someone or punishing someone almost uh, you know against a hierarchy yes that also that's very that's a very important thing sometimes they children also say what they don't like about what the teacher said and that's you know it, it happens in the course of conversation and the teacher also has to admit to that 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 was not right you know when we deal with communities like this you know their dignity is a very important uh, aspect and this is something that we need to build into the child 
right from the very very early age because constantly this is something that is being uh, chopped away at a very early age so how does one maintain this and so one of the ways is through through the language of course and uh, the recognition of their own community their elders so when when we call somebody from the from the village into the classroom and get them also to be to talk about things then that person is on par with any teacher in the school so here what we are try to do is to to have this seamless continuum between the village or the community and the school now this is uh, very important because they should not think of the school as being separate uh, as as happens uh, anywhere the a school is a uh, you know as a separate entity from the home but here there is no that separation is something that you are try to break so the the community also feel that they can come into the classroom at any point and uh, suggest things that are needed for the lives of the children because the teachers are also from the community so they don't see any difference between themselves and the teacher and the child you see yeah just to um, highlight actually you know when children are are humiliated in a school and as such children are often humiliated in mainstream schools it's not done by articulating it in a clear conceptual way and telling them that look this is what you are it is done through relationships it is done through silencing certain cultures it is done through highlighting other cultures what is happening here is the flip of that again not through conceptually articulating and telling explicitly that we are equals and i don't know if you can do that in a primary school but here other kinds of relationships are being built which are as as uh, raman ram das saying which are giving dignity which are giving recognition to and, and recognition is so important uh, it's something that we have to also show in our relationship with the teachers personally i mean when we interact with the teachers how is our relationship is there a power hierarchy there are we trying to impose things unknowingly i mean these messages also have to be very clear to the teachers and to the uh, who will pass this on or who will communicate this to the children Yes yes I I like how you mentioned that teachers and administrators play a key role in asserting hierarchies and establishing the characteristics of the dominant culture I was curious about this decision that that you already mentioned about recruiting teachers directly from the community in which students are from uh, could we explore that some more when you talk about being political this is what we are saying the saying is that you take control over your lives and your community the day we took children we took adivasi teachers and we told them also that this is your school and we are leaving this school we will say stay with you as long as you want and do whatever you want but this is your school and we are leaving it may take 5 years 10 years 15 years but it's yours so from day 1 we talk about leaving so this is a very very important thing because you you cannot talk about making somebody powerful without disempowering yourself you know and power is a very finite thing in any situation somebody cannot become powerful without someone else becoming less powerful <laughs> this is a very conscious thing that we are always uh, we keep in mind right right and i was also curious about the kind of engagement this article has received outside the pages of epw uh, there is a very important uh, lesson that we we learned from it you know the important lesson was that uh, while we were much um, you know taken up with the whole the fact that the ams was able to do what it did we also realized that somewhere in the it is only after the article that we realized the limitation of it also that we could take uh, we could take the child up to the threshold of the school but we couldn't do anything inside the classroom you see the movement can can go up to the uh, right up to the threshold of a classroom but it can't do anything inside that calls for a completely different uh, strategy and this learning itself was a very important eye opener for us among the two kinds of problems that we have today in academics we have several kind but two is one is that on the one hand there will be a large number of people who are willing to critique but are unwilling to try to build anything and that's the history of academics which has created such a situation because we aren't connected to communities we aren't connected to movements so we aren't connected to inst- institution building this takes us into a situation where we are willing to critique but we are unwilling to improve upon things you know? that's one dynamics the other dynamics is that when we do try to work with things and we are very unwilling to question those institutions and which is connected with the rise of the ngo culture and uh, uh, academics being researchers uh, directly with ngos uh, there again the problem is that they don't usually set out to question the basics of that 
which is part of the politics of knowledge. So there's a politics of knowledge in the first thing which I talked about. There's a politics of knowledge in the second also that too often we find NGOs and in today's times are being controlled very strongly by funders and discouraged from any fundamental question. So you improve a little bit of this government school, do something that government school. But why? What are the, the deeper social conflicts which are shaping this situation? There's a there's a shying away from that. And we, I'm finding academics are being sucked into that also. You know? Like, for instance, to say that I will improve uh, a, a government school without asking what that improvement is. You know, so getting better marks is an improvement without doing, for example, the kind of questioning which AMS does that at the end of getting marks, if a child is sucked away from the community and only begins to work for those who are part of the manipulation of the community, then that's not what we want from the schooling. Uh, this kind of questioning, most NGOs working in education are, are reluctant to do because that gets them into trouble with funders also, partly. Second, of course, is that um, there's, a dyna- there's a dynamics within academics which does not help us to think of this systemically or to think of it systemically with an alternative vision in mind. Very often I find academics who do things systemically, they stop with saying, oh, this is wrong. And they say, oh, this is just reproducing inequality. All right. So we don't want to reproduce inequality. But so what do you want to build? Yes, agreed. Uh, perhaps we won't get a chance to cover this part in, in, in as much depth as it deserves. But, but I wanted to learn more about uh, how COVID-19 and governmental rules have affected student learning. That has become a big challenge for us now. We try to get in touch with the class 5 students. Of them, only three of them had smartphones. and uh, But even if they had it, they couldn't access many of the uh, things because they couldn't get internet. So, because the villages are very distant. So, it's very difficult now. So, we have to now find ways of reaching out to them where they can come to an area where they can get internet at a time when they can get it because you cannot have it at... I know some schools, they have classes at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the night and things like that. But that is not possible for us because they cannot come to any one place at at that point of at that time in the night. So we are trying to do things only through WhatsApp. But uh, even that is very limited. Uh, The teachers were saying that another problem they're facing very, they try to put up some, you know, audios and videos and WhatsApp and get the children to look at it and put some worksheets along with that. And they try to do complete those worksheets and send it back to the teachers. So some children are doing that, but a very small number, maybe about 20% of the children, you can say, are able to do that, not more. But even for those 20% of the children, the teachers say our biggest problem is and the challenge in correction. Uh, For small children, especially class 4, 5 and all that, uh, with things like reading or with things like writing, you have to correct then and there. You can't correct it two days later and send it back to them saying this was your mistake. It doesn't register with children. So really, it's a question mark. We we met once after the lockdown was relaxed for two days and uh, had a discussion about these things. We are only we can only say we are trying. We're really struggling. Yeah, that's a grim picture. And the final question I have for you is: What are some of the unanswered questions that you continue to investigate? Among the answers, I think which this uh, study, the experience of EMS has come out with, is that a we need to build movements that apply pressure you know from the point of view of the weak so such pressures can be built primarily from by movements only but also that we need to strengthen the technical knowledges of pedagogy the, the what um, brahma ramdas was saying about what do you do inside the school you know movements can't uh, help us in that the very fact that we demand better schooling for the weak which right now powerful groups are not interested in But to demand this is coming from movements and that's an important thing which we need to to keep strengthening. But we also need to now invest in building those technical knowledges of how do you teach? What do you do uh, in the classroom? That has to be done. Now, this is what is coming out of this study, but we need a a bigger picture also. We need a a more complete picture. What else is called for? When when will such a a time come when we will get a, a just and an empowering education system? And which is actually a larger also intellectual project and research project, uh, which is of looking at experiences around the world. Uh, what kind of factors emerged in other countries when things began to improve over there, in other situations when things began to improve over there. I've d- done another small study, actually literature-based study, which compares Thailand and Finland, very different 
situations, very different experiences, but both have um, substantially improved the uh, equality in the education systems. You know? Why were they able to do it? You know, which social groups formed? What dynamics took place over there that this was able to happen? Yes, yes. Aman, Ramdas and Rama, thank you so much for joining us on Research Radio. We covered a lot of ground on the topic of transformative education for Adivasi communities. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For giving Good. us this opportunity to speak about these things. <laughs> yeah, to think about these things, I yeah. think, more than anything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Two things stood out to me from that conversation. Rama's description of how, the, of how the school tries to address conflicts in a dignified manner and the school's practice of bringing in elders to share their knowledge with the same authority as teachers. A running thread throughout our conversation was about how critical pedagogy, which sounds quite attractive and appealing on paper, can be put into practice. I do recommend reading the article for more insights on this perhaps uh, ambitious goal of actualizing critical pedagogy and I've shared a link to it in the description of this podcast. Next week, we will speak to Payal Hathi and Nikhil Shivastav about how caste-based discrimination by Savarnas negatively affects the health of patients and leads to exploitative work conditions for hospital cleaners. I am looking forward to that conversation and if it sounds interesting to you too, do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Take care and I'll see you next week. <laughs>